A relative of mine, Tony Watson, there we go, the man here, the man from Boobly, had to go to Wolverhampton with great inconvenience to all, and he's one of over 80 men a year who leave Hereford, Worcestershire, to go elsewhere for this treatment. He is here tonight, but we join in the prostate cancer support group. Welcome, Tony, and well done. In future, such treatment will be done at the Alex. On the 16th of December 2016, a VIP event took place at the Alex. It was the final push to create major publicity for the campaign and public awareness for the need for robotic surgery for the local trust. Paul Rajaban, who worked hard with me and the Da Vinci manufacturers, got the machine at the Alex for, the, for this particular day. And now, six, year on, six years on, the robotic machine will be finally operative and back home at the Alex. I am currently working with the Director of Communications of the Local NX Trust, the local MP for Redditch, Rachel McLean, and the local media, including 2B, to achieve maximum exposure for the launch of the robotic machine. This will be done at the optimum time to create maximum awareness for prostate cancer in Hereford, Worcestershire, which has one of the highest incidence of the disease in the UK. Remember, still, one man dies every half an hour of the disease. On the, the 11th of March 2016, the local MP for Bromsgrove launched the Morris campaign at the Bromsgrove store. Amongst the hundreds who attended was Mr. Mackay, a local resident, and on that day, Morrison's gave him a cheque for £25,000. The local MP, Sandra Jarvis, was then Secretary of State for Government Business. Today, he's Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. I will be contacting his team shortly, and I'm sure his support will not only help the government's levelling up campaign locally, but give a well-timed boost to the launch of the Baltic machine at the Alex. Mr. Mackay and Lisa Capaldi will now outline the retraining of current staff and training of new staff recruited to work on the robotic service and outline the development plans to be implemented. There's an old saying which really applies to the Rory campaign. Bumpy roads lead to beautiful places. Shortly the half a million rays will be spent and then it will be time for us all to celebrate. Well done to you all. Thank you. Thank you. 
as a support group that we should, of course, sit behind whatever is done. And to that end, we do think that it's worth laying our school out in terms of a whole range of little things that we think will add up. And we need your help. There are things to be done that are pretty obvious, articles for local papers. Occasionally, important VIPs appearing or talking on local radio, and that can be done a bit more upon as well. And a few events that we've had in the past and we're going to have in the future, now that things are returning a little more to normal. And we would hope that some of you would help us with stands at events and the like. So please, if you feel you've got a few ideas, skills, suggestions to do with how we can help the Trust and the launch itself with an awareness raising campaign in the future, please let Mary or myself know. Two other quick things, sorry, differently. We are delighted that Tackle, that federation of all the sport groups across the country, is looking much, much more positive and constructive now. The fact that the project manager for Tackle lives in the Midlands is our luck. She's going to hold one first regional get-together for up to 10 people from each support group in the Midlands region. Again, if you would like to come along, would you let me or Mary know? We'd like to be sure that we do get 10 people on May the 16th, it's a Monday, to join us. We want people who know a little bit about the background, of course, to the prostate story, and also have done a little bit of work, perhaps in the past, with Mary or the support group, because we do feel that the Kidderminster Worcestershire group have got a lot to offer to the network of other groups in the Midlands. There is actually a really super duper representative and trustee now from the Midlands, from the Coventry group, A. Atkins, who is actually going to be at that meeting and help to run it. So anybody who is available thinks you could help us, let us know would you do that. Thanks very much. And one final thing is that we do these days have some quite sweet little posters, A5 posters. Uh, Mr. McCarr knows that they appear in most of the rooms, consulting rooms at the hospital. We think they should be in a lot more consulting rooms. How about your GP practice surgeries, waiting rooms? They are now accepting again if material like this is laminated, short and sweet. Again, would you let us know if you'd be willing to get one of these put into your GP surgery or elsewhere where it would be useful? Obviously it has the usual logo things on it and the contact website and telephone numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Right. Um, I don't see if Mr. McCarran is ready. Would you like to sit at the table then, Mary? Is that any jokes? How was the flight here?
it will help to uh, uh, consolidate the uh, urology team at the Alexander Hospital. And uh, I think that's another reason why I was extremely pleased that after all the years and all, all the hard work by all the people involved, um, that uh, it is going to the Alexander Hospital. So it's a good feather in the cap for, for Worcestershire, but also for the Alex, for the team that work really hard there looking after everybody um, and their ways concerned and that sort of thing. So uh, I'll just push you back to the other hand. It's not all doom and gloom because prostate cancer, most of the cases, if they get diagnosed a little bit late, that's fine. We'll be able to deal with it. But here comes the next problem. Waiting list for prostatectomy in the Midlands now is at least six months. Well, anywhere in the Midlands. That's not because people are not working hard. It's because the numbers of backlog for almost two years, it, it was not possible to subject people, healthy men, with a relatively straightforward prostate cancer, if there's such a thing, to subject them to have COVID, well, at a time when we didn't know what COVID is, how to treat it. That would have a much stronger position because not only we had vaccines, but also we know how to treat it to a large extent. And that's why, in, despite the fact that there is huge numbers of COVID in the community now, more so than at any other time in the pandemic, 
there is more gold in positive patients around us now, this group now, I guess there is probably about 150 people here tonight. So there will be, out of this 150 people, 15 people with COVID, and they don't know it. The incidence in Worcester at the moment is 1 in 10. So despite this huge number of COVID cases, we're seeing a tiny proportion of them dying as opposed to the huge calamity and the numbers of deaths that we saw in the pandemic. That's because the vaccines are protecting us against dying. They're not very good at protecting us against catching it unless you only had the vaccine three, four weeks ago. Because the immune system is two parts, as you know now. There's antibodies and there's cell-mediated immunity. The antibodies are very high for a period of about three months after the booster dose. And if you have very high antibodies, you're very unlikely to get COVID. Actually, you're protected to the tune of 95% to contract it, but only for this two to three months. After two to three months, the antibody levels drops down, so you will catch it if you're exposed to it. The protection is less than 30% after more than three months. However, if you catch it, you're very unlikely to die from it, which is a good thing. Which is what happened to me two weeks ago when I caught it. Having dodged it for over two years, I caught it and I didn't die. So it's not all doom and gloom. But because of that, because we are unlikely to die from COVID now, we are able to operate on people now, so trying our best to catch up. But here's the problem, if 70% have presented and they start to come back, the waiting list rather than going down is going to go up again. But prostate cancer is, to a large extent, a friendly disease, if there is such a thing. Because if your cancer is low or intermediate risk, a delay of six months, a delay of a year, a delay of 18 months, isn't going to do you much harm. It's going to do you, your head in. You will be worried, or your loved ones will be worried to death. But actually, it's not going to harm. If it is a very aggressive prostate cancer and that delay will harm you, we've got good treatment to stop that from harming you until you get to have your surgery or your radiotherapy or other treatments, which is the hormone treatment. We're lucky in prostate cancer that we have a very effective holding treatment to allow us to sensibly schedule you to have your radiotherapy or your surgery or whatever else you're going to have without significant impact on you because of the delays. So my message today is please carry on what you're doing. Raise the flag for prostate cancer. Increase awareness of the condition. Get people to get diagnosed and try to support them and tell them, yeah, You'll get that most, you'll join the queue, the queue is long at the moment, we're working hard to reduce it. However, it's better to be in the queue and have your treatment in six months or in a year or whatever long it is, than ignore it and then discover it five, six years later when there's nothing much you can do about it. So the message from the National Prostate Cancer Audit and from Public Health Saint is please, please. And you will hear you will hear it on the news or risk factors if you're over 50, if you are of uh, Afro Caribbean uh, ethnic uh, origin, or if you've got a family history of prostate and breast cancer. Um, let's go back to Rory the Robot and let's correct a couple of Rory the Robot is fantastic. The help that we had from you to collect the money is fantastic. When, um, after uh, he 
yet uh, the group met with the uh, uh, big weights in the trust a couple of years ago. They decided to dismantle or the, the group. I tried my best to reassure them that I've been in the NHS now for about 30 years. Um, I do have the NHS works for dozens sometimes. For the 20 years I've been in Worcestershire now for these 30 years, we've had, and I start to be corrected, about 10 chief executives. About 10 chief executives in the 20 years, about 15 chief medical officers. About 10 chief finance officers. If you think about it, that's each one of them on average is staying about a couple of years. So there is no continuity. I can't change that. You can't change that. This is the way the country is being run, unfortunately. But what I've always said, don't despair, because there are some constants that do change, but very, very slowly. These constants, or quasi constants, will dictate what will happen. And these constants are geography and demography. The geography of Worcestershire, although it will change over the years and decades and uh, millennia, but it's very, very slow change. And the demography of Worcestershire will change and is changing, but very, very slowly. And the reality of geography and demography means that we will continue for the foreseeable future and beyond to have a very well educated population in Austria, very long living population in Austria, very good GPs in Austria, although sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but we have on the whole got very lucky, very good GPs. And uh, very high incidence of prostate cancer, much higher than the national average. So these facts are going to dictate what will happen. Glory in the road is nothing but a piece of kit. It isn't going to make a huge difference to the care that a single person will have. Gear is a single indemnity amount in similarity every week and despair, absolutely despair about men whose high risk of prostate cancer are being under treated because they read the mail and they decided to have robotic surgery which is very, very inappropriate for their high risk disease. But one of the beauties about the NHS is that money doesn't come into it. The relationship between the doctor and the patient is not dependent on you pay me, I do this for you. Not like in America or other healthcare systems. And once money comes in the middle, the trust is eroded. Because I've got a robot, I'm selling the robotic prosthetic, it's going to pick up rich. And the NHS is not like that. It shouldn't be like that. In the NHS, you give the patient the appropriate advice, which is honestly what is in his or her best interest. Unfortunately, when a government of some color decided to introduce the market forces in the NHS, the trusts and the healthcare providers became opponents. They compete which is with each other because they want more patients to treat because they get paid by the results. That's what they said. It wasn't by results, it's payment by activity. You do 10, you get paid 10. You go 100, you do 100, you get paid 100. So they started to snatch patients from each other. They started to buy robots left, right, and center. Because you know what the Americans say? You've got the halo effect if you've got a robot. You're sending a message out to say, I am up to date, I've got all the technology, I'm the best. So you attract custom. And when 
trust and tax custom, they get more income, and then they become foundation trusts, and they was on this. One of the best things that happened in the last two, three years, I have to say, the reason it happened is by necessity, because the country, if you don't know, is going bankrupt. So they wanted to stop this payment by, by results, which is payment by activity. They want to say, only do it if it's needed. So we're going in whole circle again, we're going back to the good old days of the regional health society. And we cut the cake according to the size of the population. We'll give you the money as a health society. Now they call it, what do they call it now? treatment systems or something like that. Anyway, so we found another name for the regional health society. We will be given an amount of money, Worcestershire or an area of that size will be given about two billion pounds a year for health services. That's for GPs, for hospitals, for ambulances, for everything. And that's it. There is no more money. You do robotic prostatectomy, you do open prostatectomy, you don't do prostatectomy at all, you do bariatric surgery, you do kids services, whatever you do, that's your law. And they go to another area, they give them a piece of the cake according to the size of the population. I think actually that's a better system. Because now we're going to stop snatching patients from each other. Now we're going to stop pretending that robot is right for everybody, which it isn't. Of course it is right for some people. And when it is right, it's fantastic. The problem is it's being abused. And the motive for that is to attract more custom, to attract more income. So thank God that's disappeared. For Ostra, hearing here from me, it will only be used for patients who are going to benefit from it. Patients who need it. Patients who have very high risk disease and will benefit more from a deep clean, as I call it, from extended lymphadenectomy, from a more aggressive operation, they will have an open, more aggressive operation. They will still trust me and my colleagues because they know that they're, well, we're not going to be paid more if we do it robot or if we do it open. We're going to be paid the same. So rest assured that advice you will ever get from our service is the right advice for you. Of course, it's a free country and you can walk away and you can go to Warhampton or to London or to America if you want and have whatever you want. But this is not going to happen in Austria. And I hope that is reassuring for you. And one of the biggest reasons why I started back in 2008 the Roll in the Robot campaign. 2008. There's an old man who's retired now. It's called Andrew Grant. He was the chair of the campaign then. I recruited him. We opened the charity account in which the half a million pound is in 2008. But then we had to stop him because there was another uh, fundraising activity for the Breast Cancer Center in Austria. And we were advised that the two campaigns will hinder each other. So we have to stop to allow the breast campaign to continue. And I'm glad that the breast center was open that is enlarging now. Stopped for a few years and then we reintegrated it again after we uh, we've been um, well encouraged by angels to, to restart again. So don't worry, we were wanted to get the road to convince my patients. 
uh, go the robot, but if it's not the right operation for you, I'm not going to suggest it for you. I couldn't do that. I tried my best thing, but I couldn't convince every patient because they used to tell me, oh, he said that because he had a blood robot. Okay, fair enough. Now we've got it, you can't, you can't slow that back at us. We will use it appropriately for the appropriate patient. In exactly the same way as Lisa will talk later about the various different types of radiotherapy. And the appropriate patient gets a different dose of radiotherapy, a different plan for radiotherapy to somebody who has got a low risk disease. So rest assured you always get the appropriate advice from us. I don't want to take any more time. Um, and I want to give the mic to Lisa to say a couple of words. In a funny way, there is not a better time that I know of to get prostate cancer than now. The number of treatments, new treatments, that are extremely effective that we didn't dream of having only 10, 15 years ago is amazing. I see patients on a daily basis in their 80s and 90s going strong after 20, 30 years of diagnosis of prostate cancer. And every time, even if they are not completely cured, they were suppressing the disease. Every time it starts to pop up again, Lisa comes and says, oh, this is that new thing, we can try it. And oops, it gives them a few more years. So the future is bright, the future of prostate cancer is very bright. And it's especially so in Worcestershire because we give the right advice for the right patients. We have no motivation other than um, giving you the best advice for you. I, I told you there is uncomfortable truth, isn't there? Before I open the questions, uh, there's another uncomfortable tool that came out in the latest uh, National Prostate Cancer Audit, which is a yearly event. Um, both me and Lisa jointly lead the Worcestershire contribution to this uh, National um, Audit. And they didn't make very good reading in the last couple of years. The last year, because of the pandemic, it showed us that 30% less are coming forward. And we discussed that. And I'm counting on you to try and correct that for us. The second one I want to count on you again because we found the year before last that older patients are not being treated with curative intent. I have to say that's not happening in Worcestershire because we're treating all ages. If you're fit enough, we treat you irrespective of your age. And I, I'm sad to say that we're being criticized sometimes by some of our esteemed colleagues that we are over treating all patients. We are not ageist in Worcestershire. If you're fit enough, if you've got prostate cancer that needs treating, you will be treated with surgery or with radiotherapy was the appropriate treatment for you. So that's not a problem in Australia. There is another problem, which is high risk disease, local and advanced disease, is not being treated aggressively enough. And there I say, I would say it, it's driven by the robot. So, if the disease is a bit too much for the robot, the robotic surgeons who are not doing open surgery, they advise the patient not to have surgery because the disease is not curable and they treat them palliatively. Again, I'm very happy to say this is not the case in Worcester. We're very aggressive. If your disease has any chance of cure, you 
again offered the cumulative treatment, whether it's aggressive surgery or aggressive radiotherapy, or as we often call it, multi-modality treatment. We'll give you the surgery first, hormones, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, novel treatments, you name it. We don't give up on people because their disease is aggressive. As a matter of fact, we believe that people with aggressive disease deserve more treatment, not less treatment. So you don't have to worry about that most. You have to worry about the people who are not coming forward. There's another uncomfortable truth found by the National Audit, which is people of ethnic minorities are not being treated as often as indigenous white Caucasians. Now, it's a complex issue. Although there is racism in the country, there is racism in the NHS, I happen to believe that this is not the reason. The reason is, look at the room around you. There isn't a single man or woman of color. Why is that? Do they not exist? They do, but they, for some reason or another, they don't feel that they're welcome in a gathering like that. They don't hear who they are not reaching them for some reason. So they don't hear all these new developments. They don't get the encouragement to come forward and present to their GP and have a PSA. And it's incumbent upon us as a whole to change that. It's not going to be easy. But it will have to be that we will send the battalion from our charity to go to the mosque next door, to go to the synagogue somewhere, uh, to go to their gathering, to go to the curry house. There is actually somebody on telly that I saw not long ago in a curry house somewhere, I think up north somewhere, who made the people, if you, you have a curry as well. It was for vaccination because they had the same problem. They were coming forward for COVID vaccine. So he said, come and have your jab and jet freezing together in the curry house. <laughs> and, and he had some success. So we need to look out for our fellow citizens who looks slightly different than us and try to invent some ways to encourage them to come and mingle with us and uh, gain the benefits of early diagnosis and, and appropriate treatment. And certainly that was very, very uh, visible in the National Prostate Cancer Law. I suppose Worcestershire as a county has got less than 2% ethnic minority population. So this is not a massive problem because the numbers are small, but for every one of them who doesn't get diagnosed and gets advanced and metastatic disease because he didn't come forward, it makes a huge difference to them. In areas, I suppose, like in inner city Birmingham, the numbers of ethnic minorities are much, much higher. Their problem is much, much bigger, and they have to find a way of dealing with that. So I'll stop here. Be proud that you've got a robot, but not every one of you will have his operation by the robot. Only those who will benefit from it and whom it is appropriate, it will be offered to them. Others will still have other forms of treatment. Uh, let's open the floor for questions and answers. So if 
back in whenever it was, 2013, 2014, the standard treatment was seven and a half weeks worth of radiotherapy. So quite a long haul, to be honest. And it wasn't really that long after that that we then moved to doing uh, a, a different sort of regime. And it was based on a clinical trial on the CHIP study, which I'm not sure there's any men here that were part of that study. Um, but the CHIP trial basically showed us that for low risk, intermediate risk prostate cancer, we could treat men over four weeks. So that's also a lot more acceptable for, for most people, particularly if you're traveling a long way. So the standard treatment actually from that point on was four weeks worth of radiotherapy. So that was the next move on. The next stage on, which we've just sort of come to the end of, was something called the PACE trial. I don't think there's any men here that are part of that trial. Probably not. Um, so the PACE trial is moving on yet yeah, again with the regime of radiotherapy to, to try and give men treatments, the same dose of treatment, but to give it over five days rather than 20 days. And it's using a technique called SABRE, which is stereotactic body radiotherapy. So we were just part of a clinical trial called the PACE study. We managed to recruit very quickly, actually, within the few months that we were open. And unfortunately, the trial is now closed. But we got probably about 20 people over a couple of months into that trial, which was pretty good going. So all I'm trying to say that each time, every few years, radiotherapy is moving on. We're now at the point of trying to give patients very short treatments, which obviously is better for, for you guys. It's, it's probably better for us because it means we can get more people through more quickly. Um, so that, that's really what I wanted to say. If anybody's heard about SABRE, then yes, we are moving in that direction. And I suspect it will become standard treatment reasonably soon, once all the trials have, have um, what's the word? finished and the, the results have come out. <coughs> there is another trial that hopefully we're going to be opening in the next six months or so, which is an add-on to the PACE trial. So I don't know if you've heard about it, Adele, this is the PACE nose trial. So it's for men who are either intermediate or high risk, which actually is probably most of the men that we see. And it's, it's trying to give them radiotherapy not only to the prostate, but also to the lymph glands, which is what Adele was talking about, trying to treat men more aggressively rather than giving them a half-hearted go at it. We can actually treat the whole lot, but again, do it over five days. So in the olden days, it used to be seven and a half weeks, definitely, for the lymph node treatment. So we're now hoping to get men through on five days for all of that. So again, that's, that's a really positive move. So we're hoping to try and get that open in the next six months. So I think maybe just open for questions is probably easier, isn't it? That's amazing. I can't believe what's happening now. It's a long time since I worked in the NHS, but things are happening dramatically. Right, anybody would like to ask questions <coughs> of uh, Mr. Lapa or Ms. Capaldi?
the, um, uh, the damage to surrounding organs, i.e. Yeah. the urinary tract or the bowel? In, in general, yes, and I think that's possibly borne out with the, um, the National Prostate Cancer Audit. Our, our toxicity rates in Worcestershire are generally very low, probably one of the lowest in the country, I think, from what I wrote. So that's rectal toxicity and bladder toxicity. Um, prostatectomy and then I've got uh, secondary uh, cancer on a, on a lymph node. But I've had treatment with uh, image guided radiotherapy and I wondered if that's available in Worcestershire now. Yes, it is actually. We've, we've just been approved. Uh, so there's a, a national uh, radiotherapy process we have to go through. Um, so each centre has to go through some. Stage would be 
need to do spines. So if somebody develops something in the spine, at some point in the future we'll be able to do that. Yeah. I was quite lucky, you know, my doctor knew the last of this treatment and uh, I don't think it was very well you did in the rest of them, but she no, sent me to the QE and I was really lucky to have that treatment and yeah. uh, put on the time machine. That's right. And, so uh, Okay. I mean, personally, I'm at, I'm at uh, the early stages of the moment. I've gone had the biopsy, um, I've had the MRI, I have now had a CT scan. Thursday, I've got my results. From what I was told when I had the um, MRI, as far as you can see, mine was contained at the moment. It's, it's cancer, but it's, it's contained. I've got this decision, I'm, I'm assuming, not knowing really what stages the cancer is at the moment or how it's progressing, the best thing to do. So I don't know whether to have it removed, the prostate removed, or to have this radiotherapy. Without uh, having all that information in front of us, we'll not be able to give you advice now. Uh, what I suggest is you uh, talk to one of our CNSs to give her uh, your details. Uh, we'll go back and see who's the consultant looking after you and make sure that you have a discussion with him. Um, it sounds like you had all the tests done. It's just putting things together now and offering you the options available. Okay, well, fortunately, I'm down to one of the I'm, I'm from uh, Kings Norton, so I'm random living in the area. But can I just say something as well regarding you, where you're saying making people aware of things? I'm really angry with my GPs because I've had at least two well known clinics over the years. The one was three years ago. And this is never mentioned. Why is this? Why is this not mentioned when you have these so called well known clinics? How old were you when you saw him? Sorry? How old were you when you saw him ten years ago? How good was I? How old, How old was I? I'm sorry. I'm 72 now. So the last one I had was uh, three years ago. Uh, I can't answer that question. Um, the, I've, 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 you can tell that before you can't you? Anywhere in the world when you say to somebody, How are you? Why is that answer? A good or a bad. In the UK, and take that very up, well, be very careful what I say here. When you say to somebody, How are you? He says something that I struggle with. Not too bad. What does it mean? As a foreigner coming to live here 30 years ago, I struggle to understand. Is he telling me that he's good? Or is he telling me that he's bad? I still struggle with it until now. After 30 years. So we tend to do this this way in this country. So we sit on the fence a lot. Yeah. So our government, for better or worse, decided to tell the GPs, don't, don't tell them about the PC. But if they ask you, do it. It's a bizarre position. But they tell them, that, they teach them that in the medical school. Don't tell them about the PSA, don't mention that at all. But it's a free country, if they ask to have it, do it. So if you don't ask, you don't get it. But the, the first thing they ask you is what symptoms you got. Well, if you don't have symptoms, they, they, they say no. Yeah, but what do I do if you got no symptoms? 
But this is the issue. Prostate cancer is not a disease that gives symptoms. It only gives symptoms when it's very advanced. And all the symptoms that men get is not from the cancer of the prostate. It's from the benign bit of the prostate. So when your hair goes grey, your prostate gets a bit bigger, and you get up in the night and your flow slows down. That has nothing to do with whether you've got cancer or not. But we say all the things.
as they can do any furniture restoring or cycling or whatever that they wish to do. We're desperately short of people. We need two or three more people. If anyone's of any interest, please see me at the end. So that's the plea. I do have a question though to you though. I think a very important one for our committee. Uh, the thing that is uh, causing us most grief at the moment perhaps is awareness, how to bring about awareness, how to make sure that, um, it sounds crazy, but that the rates of prostate cancer uh, in this county continue to go up because they have been spotted early on. So the question to you both is, do you think that um, one of the important factors was uh, to do with set events, or is it just just going and pushing with the GPs um, if we can see them? Um, you know, what we would, if you were on the committee, if you were on our committee, what would you be recommending us to do to increase awareness? I think, to be honest, I would say more of the same because you've been quite successful. And when we talk about 30% less, that's nationally. I haven't got the breakdown for Worcestershire yet, but the Worcestershire population would be less than that. Um, I think treating prostate cancer patients every day as I do. It's amazing how much support they need. Uh, my, uh, my nearest and nearest recently had prostate cancer and they had to go through the treatments, uh, a couple of them. And the men are like that, men are not like women. Women are very comfortable with their emotions and talking about their health issues. Men are Horrible. They don't talk about anything. They do talk of facades that they are strong, they have to be strong, they have to deal with it, and we'll sort it out. How do you sort it? My brother in law said to me, I sort it out. He went in and cried. Um, he wouldn't want anybody to know that he's crying. He's got two young kids and a young wife, and he was given the diagnosis, and it was horrendous. The only thing he's supposed to get to was a piece of cake, it was an easy operation, it was early diagnosis. Uh, but dealing with the mental um, fallout for all men is much more difficult. And I think it's that what we need to concentrate on. Um, to bring people forward, once you do your events about the support you give men, almost as a side effect to that, you will bring people forward. So you need to be visible as a group. In the rugby club, in the theatre, in, I don't know, in the county uh, hall, um, on the golf course for those who know how to play golf. And um, he is very uh, helpful. Now, we should invite GPs come to our meetings. And um, as I say, we're lucky in this show because as a whole, the GP community here are very receptive, very knowledgeable, they are very good GPs around the Western. Can I minister the particular has very good GPs actually? Uh, this isn't a question really, it's more in support of the gentleman from Irving than that. Um, we also have well-known clinics and they're attended to every year. It's my belief that they're probably done because we don't know they send for us because they get paid for it. But nevertheless, they can, they take blood samples, they never include a PSA. Six years ago, I had a terms operation, which was successful, and I was told by the consultant then, Mr. John Eaton, that I should continue to have PSA taken. The following year I went to work my well known clinic. Can you please include the PSA? No, we don't do that. Why not? Um, I was told that I can. You will be aware from your system.
systems and I've had a third top ratio. I'd like to check, please. Can't do it. I then wrote to the GP, who was a Dr. Gates at the time, acutely, and told him that I took my own personal health very seriously and I wanted to know why I shouldn't have it done. And he said, if you've had an operation, you don't need it done. However, I'll write to the consultant. He then wrote to the consultant and asked for a copy of the letter that he sent to him. And he said to the consultant that he didn't believe he needed doing. The consultant went back and said it should be, at least for the next two years, because there were some cells that were slightly unusual. And they did it. Now, bearing in mind, this third operation was six years ago. Last year, I went again, asked for the church, sorry, for a um, PSA test to be done at my well known clinic. I was refused. I phoned the doctor then because it was the nurse that was taking the blood samples who said she couldn't do it. I then phoned the doctor and said, look, I want a PSA done. I'll come down. No need, we'll add it in. Now, we've in one way we're fortunate because we do see all our blood test results online and all the other tests that we have done. So I can check them when they come back and it was done. But the point that I'm making is the gentleman's quite right. No, no matter what you do, you can, you've really got to force these GPs to allow you to have that because they say, the first thing they say to me, it's not, it's, it's not conclusive. We know that, but we've got no other test. You know, we accept that, but if we don't have it done, how are we going to possibly find out that there's anything wrong? There's no screening, it's not like breast cancer or other things. The only screening we've got is PSA, but there's still doctors out there in surgeries that don't want to do it. Yeah, I agree with you.
to go to Winfield School. But they carried on reporting the Mr. again in, in the UK only. Everywhere else in the world. Once they went to medical school, they called the doctor. Uh, the moral of the story is when you have a young, up and coming, excited, excitable surgeon, you have to put him in, in a team who is an older, more wisely, wildly person to contain his excitement and to ensure that the apprenticeship carries on over uh, the generations. A man very excited by having the robot because now we will be able to attract the young, up and coming, bright people, um, put them in the team and start to usher them in the right direction. Uh, frankly, without the robot, we will about to close urological services in Austria because we have a huge shortage nationwide for factors beyond our control and we will not be competitive enough because of the old. Having given this rather gloomy outlook, actually I'm very excited because we have other things going on for us in Austria and in neurology in Austria that doesn't happen anywhere else in the country and sometimes in the world. And lots of people are excited to come to join us for that. But the other thing that we didn't mention there, or probably should mention, we worked hard with Worcester University over the last 10 years to start a medical school in Worcester. And we had our ups and downs, ups and downs. Eventually, we got approval to open a medical school, but the government said we have got money to send you students. So we can open a medical school, but we're not going to be able to recruit homegrown students because the government doesn't have money to get them student loan. That's how bad the economy is. So we started by advertising the new medical school abroad. The hotels don't want to come because we Brexited. So we started to have to advertise it outside the European Union and we go applicants. They are going to be paying an awful lot of money to study medicine in Austria. We're recruiting as we speak. The interviews are next week for the new medical students. But as resourceful, resourceful as Worcestershire people are, a couple of companies, businesses in Worcestershire, put forward a grant of a couple of million pounds to support homegrown people. So effectively, now we are able to recruit. We have no government money, but we've got charity money from businesses in Worcestershire and we will recruit a number, a small number by its start of home students, homegrown students and they wouldn't even have to have a student loan because they, they, they have a bursary. So as of next year, then, this calendar year, there will be new medical students in Worcestershire and one of the things that we are working on is to attract people who would like to stay in Worcestershire in the future. So we're giving them bonus points in their applications. If you declare to us that you wanted to stay in Worcestershire and make a new home, that would give you a bonus point and you're more likely to be recruited to the new medical school than if you are going to go away somewhere else. And we make no apologies for that. We need doctors for Worcestershire and we're looking forward to the future. So the future is bright. Not in 
Club too. The problem was screening is especially with roads around I'm afraid. It's a very uh, important once you say to somebody you've got cancer, me and Lisa will know that this cancer isn't gonna harm him for another 10, 20 years if it's uh, it's very small. And the, the best thing to do perhaps is to monitor it. And we try to do that. But emotionally they become very nervous and half of them, 50% of them, will have very small cancer. That may never give them a, any problem during their lifetime. 50% of them stop the monitoring. Not because the disease is progressing, it's because they lost their nerves. They end up having the treatment, but there is no treatment without side effects. There are side effects. They are not horrendous, but they can be. And if you screen people and get a man in his 40s or 50s or whatever at his prime, and then diagnose a one millimeter cancer, which may not cause him any trouble throughout his life, then he ruined his life and his family life by telling him he's got cancer. Because cancer is a very important word. But he, he may opt to rationally have a treatment that leave him worse off. So once you start screaming, that's millions and millions and millions of men. We're not going to be diagnosing 40,000 cases a year as we do in the country. We're going to be diagnosing 150,000 a year, like what they do in France. Now, some would be would benefit those with high risk disease that you diagnosed early, and they would benefit. Some will lose. The judgment for better or worse now of the current and the previous government and quite a lot of the medical profession suggests that we're not going to be screening any time soon. The reason they tell us is because the losers will outweigh uh, those who will benefit. See, in a public health setting, you end up harming more people than benefiting the, uh, However, I have, cynical as I am, I feel that they just do not have the manpower nor the facilities to treat the number of patients that they are going to diagnose. So it's easier for them to err on the side of not screening for the time being. This might change in the future, but not anytime soon, no more the current state of the medicine.